Karen Taylor has worked for the Texas Department of Public Safety in Austin for 16 years. As a forensic artist, she helps identify skeletons by recreating what the person looked like when alive. Her images are distributed by police and the media in the hopes that the remains will be identified. Using techniques she's developed over the years, Taylor has had remarkable success. She serves police jurisdictions throughout Texas and works on cases across the country. Her job keeps her extremely busy. The unidentified woman from Yellow House Canyon was one among many nameless persons awaiting a face. Deputy Tom Watson from the Lubbock County Sheriff's Office brought me the skull of an unidentified white female uh, found in that area and he asked that I try to build a face on that skull to help him identify her. And the information was provided to me that had been uh, developed by an anthropologist who examined the, the skeleton. And so I knew from, from Tom's reports that the person I was going to be drawing was a young white female. I unfortunately didn't have a lot of other information. There was no clothing, for instance. Clothing is a very good uh, clue as to body weight for me from, ske from skeletal remains. There was also no hair, which provides a, a added complication, especially in a case of a female. So because um, there was so little to work with, the case was a little more difficult than, than some of them are. Without the victim's clothing to use as a guideline, Taylor had to take her cues from the skull alone. When putting a face on a human skull, one of the most critical parts is determining how thick the flesh will be. Taylor relies on standard tables of measurements developed by forensic anthropologists and classified by sex and race. Based on these measurements, she cuts out rubber markers that match the average depth of the skin. She glues them onto the skull at 21 anthropological landmarks like the cheeks and chin. When the markers are in place, photographs of the skull are taken. For Taylor to accurately draw the face, the photographs must be exactly life-size and not distorted at all. After placing transparent paper over the photograph, she uses the rubber markers as guides in drawing the facial contours. It's the first step in recreating the image that may lead to the identity of the victim. Taylor also relies on scientific formulas to draw in the eyes, nose, and other features. The average human eyeball is between 24 and 25 millimeters in diameter. Since this is also the size of a U.S. quarter, Taylor has a convenient tool for tracing in each eye. I also know from reading some ophthalmology uh, texts that the average person has an iris diameter, an iris width really, um, that is between 11 and 13 millimeters. And I have little red lines on this scale showing the average range. So, and I've checked it on a number of people and it seems to hold true for most everyone. Most everyone's iris will fall right in that range. Taylor relies on her knowledge of anatomy to draw in the eyelids. On many people, the orbit, or eye socket, has a raised piece of bone on its outer edge. The inner edge of the socket has another bony landmark. These are the points of attachment for the ligament that stretches across the eyeball and controls the movement of the eyelid. Our upper lids are curved slightly more than the lower lids. They tend to drop slightly over the top of the iris when looking at a person in life. Taylor next draws the victim's nose, relying on some rules of thumb and hints provided by the skull. Surprisingly, uh, we do have some pretty good information about noses to help predict uh, the look of a nose in life based on the, the bony clues. Because the victim was a white female, Taylor knows to add five millimeters to each side of the nasal opening. That represents the width of the nose. If the victim were African-American, 
Taylor would add eight millimeters to each side. A bony spine at the base suggests how far the nose projects. Because that little bit of bone uh, tells me whether to tip the nose down or to tip it up or whether it's rather level. And so I'm looking at the profile to determine that angulation of the nasal spine and that gives me a hint. In this case, this is quite an upturned nasal spine so I want a, a tip of a nose that's up. She's a young girl, she's got a youthful little nose and the nasal spine tells me it's turned up at the tip. When the mouth is relaxed, the lips tend to cover the six front teeth. When we smile, we flash as many as 10 teeth. Taylor draws the unidentified woman's mouth in a relaxed expression to give her a neutral appearance. So if I make a mark at the outside of those canines, that should give me an approximation of the width of the mouth. If you can see the staining of the gum line uh, at the edge of the enamel of the teeth, gives us a, a ballpark idea of the vertical dimension for the lips. And again, I'm think, I know that she's young, I know that she's white, um, so I'm thinking young white female as I draw this little mouth. From a faceless skull, Taylor will soon create the image of a woman. She hopes it will give a name to the victim and eventually name the killer. As Karen Taylor added the finishing touches to her portrait of the unidentified woman, the victim's face was reborn. The image was now ready for prime time. Taylor's drawing was shown on television and local newspapers, giving anyone who recognized the woman the opportunity to provide information about her. For Sheriff's Deputy Tom Watson, the broadcast was a defining moment in the case. The callers identified Taylor's drawing as Belinda K. Tillery, who'd been missing for two years. One of the callers was Tillery's mother, who had lost touch with her daughter. The face on the screen delivered an eerie shock of recognition. Now, with a name to go with the face, Taylor obtained a copy of Belinda Tillery's driver's license photograph. She compared it to her drawing to study the similarities that led to Tillery's identification. The resemblance was undeniable. She has narrow, or, or rather close-set eyes, and yet very broad face, broad cheeks. And this small nose, and the, the width of the nose proportionately is very close here. The, the mouth size is almost exactly right. And the fact that there's a very wide chin favorably compares also. For closer identification, Taylor superimposed the photograph of Belinda Tillery onto the victim's skull. As I was able to get the, the facial image on top of the skull and start to compare it, I had a couple of difficulties by this method. I, one being that her face is slightly turned in her driver's license photo, therefore I, I can't quite get the nose positioned correctly. However, when I put the eyes pretty much centered in the orbits, I see that she does have the, the facial width that my drawing shows and that I could see in this skull. So I could see that it's a pretty favorable comparison and we probably should uh, go ahead with uh, finding dental records on this person if possible to make a, a more positive comparison. 